My name's Pip Nicholson. I'm the Dean of the Melbourne Law School and it's an extraordinary pleasure to welcome you here tonight in person. And for those of you joining us virtually, heartfelt hellos from G08 at Melbourne Law School. I want to start by acknowledging that the law school sits on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past and present and to their emerging leaders also. The law school recognises an extraordinary debt in knowledge to the continuous development of Indigenous laws over some 60,000 years in this country. It is very exciting to have a real rare books lecture. And my understanding is this has been rescheduled numerous times. First, a twinkle in the eye of my dear friend, Andrew Godwin, in September of 2020. So um, we are delighted to have this wonderful evening ahead of us tonight. A couple of quick housekeeping matters. There will be a live Q&A following the lecture this evening. And for those joining us online, the chat function has been disabled, but we do welcome your questions. Indeed, we very much look forward to your questions. Could you just please submit them via the Q&A function and not use the chat function? For those of you who are not aware, this evening's proceedings will be recorded and they'll be available on our website uh, shortly after the lecture. Now let me briefly introduce the series and then our speakers tonight. This evening's lecture is in fact the 20th Rare Books lecture series at the Melbourne Law School. The first, obviously, having been given in 2002. And the lecture series draws on the law school's collection as a starting point for more general discussion. And we're certainly going to see that this evening. In the past, the collection has been used to draw out reflections on legal business and economic history the early history and the development of the law school and publishing and book selling in Australia. I think tonight's contribution is a singularly significant uh, reflection on the profession and the contribution and leadership within it of William Arquette. As you may know, William Arquette is of particular importance to the history of the Melbourne Law School. He was indeed Australia's first barrister of Asian ethnicity or heritage. Born in Wangaratta in 1876, Mr Arquette studied at the University of Melbourne and then completed his articles at the firm then known as Maddox and Jamison, today known as Maddox. William Arquette joined the bar in 1904 and in so doing became the first ethnically Chinese barrister to practice in Melbourne. And throughout his law degree, he was particularly active in the fight against discrimination. Some of you in the audience know, but for those of you who don't, William Arquette's portrait will shortly be unveiled in the Peter O'Callaghan QC Gallery in Owen Dixon Chambers. And the historian Peter Yule has also written about Mr Arquette in his recent publication, Vic Bar, The History of the Victorian Bar. I welcome you all tonight, but I do in particular want to welcome the family of William Arquette and those who've collaborated with Associate Professor Godwin uh, in his research. Let me now turn to introduce the wonderful Andrew Godwin. Andrew joined the law school as an academic in 2006 after 15 years of full-time legal practice, of which 10 were spent 
in Linklater's office in Shanghai. Um, Andrew retired from his position at MLS last year, but his links are strong and deep, and we certainly warmly welcomed Andrew as a principal fellow of the school. He is the author, author of the critically acclaimed bilingual book, a copy of which rests in the corridor outside my office, uh, that examines Chinese and English legal terminology and concepts. China Lexicon is the publication's title. Andrew's doctoral thesis examined traditional land use rights in rural China and evaluated their relevance and suitability for reform today. Andrew is not only a scholar of William Arquette, he is also very widely published in the areas of financial regulation, property law and the regulation of the legal profession. Recent publications include co-authorship of Sackful and Neve's most recent edition of Australian Property Law, the 11th edition, if I'm correct. He's also the co-editor of two further works, the Cambridge Handbook on of Twin Peaks Financial Regulation, which was out last year, I think, Andrew, and also Technology and Corporate Law, How Innovation Shapes Corporate Activity, also a recent publication in 2021. Andrew's also acted as a consultant to a broad range of organisations, which I won't list here, but we are um, uh, deeply appreciative and pleased with your ongoing links to the school, Andrew. For some time now, Andrew has been researching and writing on William Arquette, and he asked me to say, but I'm also pretty sure he'll reiterate this comment himself, he welcomes comments, insights uh, and contributions to this research from any of you in the audience. Andrew, we are honoured to host you this evening for the Rare Books Lecture 2022, and I'm delighted to hand over to you and then subsequently to Carol Hinchcliffe, who will conduct the Q&A and engage in conversation around William Marquette. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Pip. I'm grateful to you and the Law School for inviting me to deliver the Rare Book Lecture in 2022. There are many other people I'd like to thank, institutions as well, um, Carol included, who's been very helpful in my research of William Arquette, and also everyone who's helped to promote William's story more generally. It's a story that's well worth telling, and I do feel privileged to be able to participate in that storytelling. Let me also thank all of you for coming, uh, those who are here in person and also those who are online. It's great to see so many people and uh, for that I give full credit to the subject of my lecture, William Arquette. So my research into William Arquette commenced in October 2019. The Asian Australian Lawyers Association, through the efforts of two of its founding members, Raynard Tang and William Lai, both of whom are here today, invited me to attend the award ceremony for the William Arquette Scholarship at the High Court of Australia in Canberra. First awarded in 2017, the scholarship is supported financially by the law firm Maddox, where William did his articles of clerkship from 1900 to 1903. The scholarship was established, and I quote, to encourage law students, law graduates and lawyers in the early stages of their career to contribute to the development and promotion of cultural diversity in the legal profession. By chance, I happened to sit down next to one of the members of today's generation of Arquettes, and thus my journey began. As the Dean mentioned, the Rare Book Lecture Series uses the library collection as a starting point for more general discussion of a broad range of subjects. I initially thought that it was a bit anomalous, Pip, to um, use the series as a platform for talking about and historical figure, particularly when I wouldn't be focusing on any particular books, rare or otherwise. History, however, as we all know, is accessed through documents, records and books, and I've benefited enormously from having access to many rare books and documents that were either written by William or owned and used by him. 
There are also many books that make reference to William in one context or another. I'll return to some of these books and documents later in the lecture. So let me just outline what I'll be covering in my lecture. I'll start with some biographical information about William. I'll then discuss William's education and training in the law. Following that, I'll talk about William's career, including the colleagues that he had both at the bar and on the bench. And I'll conclude the substantive part of the lecture with a discussion of William's cases. I have a number of slides as part of my, my show and tell, although in places it will be more show than tell in view of the time limitations. So let me start with a bit of background information about William. As Pitt mentioned, he was born in Wangaratta in 1876, the sixth child and only son of eight children born of Chinese parents. William's father, Marquette, was from the Siyup region in Guangdong province in southern China and had arrived in Australia in the mid 19th century as a young man to work as a community leader among the Chinese workers on the gold fields in northeast Victoria. Less is known about his mother and her origins and when she arrived in Australia. This slide shows William's memorial plaque in Wangaratta, the land that his father farmed on a tributary of the Ovens River and the Wangaratta Primary School that William had attended as a child. During his work as a community leader and interpreter, William's father, Marquette, assisted the members of the Chinese community with a broad range of issues and activities, including their interactions with the legal system, the law courts, and the European community generally. As many of you would be aware, the interaction between the Chinese and the Europeans on the goldfields was often very fraught and occasionally erupted into violent clashes, such as the anti-Chinese race riot in 1857 that came to be known as the Buckland Riot. 1857, of course, is a significant year in the history of Melbourne Law School, as it was in that year that the University of Melbourne's found founding chancellor, Sir Edmund Barry, established Australia's first law course. And Sir Edmund Barry himself is significant in the history of Victoria for a number of reasons, including, of course, his role as the judge who sentenced Ned Kelly to death. William is believed to have assisted his father in his work as a community leader and interpreter. One can therefore understand how his father is likely to have had aspirations for his son to become a lawyer and community leader. And in addition to William's achievements in the law, he certainly made a valuable contribution to the local Chinese community. He was very active in Chinese community organisations and served, served as the acting consul general for China in Melbourne for three years in the 1910s. I mentioned that William was the sixth of eight children. As the first and only son of a Chinese family, William's birth in 1876 must have generated much excitement. The historical records suggest that the life of his mother, Muriel, had been a difficult and ultimately sad one, as she knew very little, if any, English, and had found it difficult to integrate into the broader society. In addition, she suffered from mental health issues and spent her final years in the Beechworth Asylum, where she died in 1896. Her husband, Marquette, died less than a week later. This must have been difficult for William, as he was only 20 years old when he lost both his parents. That said, William appears to have received much love and attention from his sisters, three of whom are depicted on this slide. The sisters were apparently very skilled in areas such as dressmaking, and three of them established a tea house in Wangaratta. I'm privileged to have met descendants of three of his sisters, Rose, Matilda and Ada, in addition to meeting William's great-granddaughter, Blossom Marquette, who coincidentally is also an interpreter, in her case, uh, in Spanish. William's wife, Gertrude Bullock, was of Scottish background. The two of them courted for four years before her father finally relented and gave his permission for William to marry her. Gertrude and William had two sons and two daughters. The elder son, Stanley Kett, did law at Melbourne University, but was tragically killed during the Second World War. 
The youngest son, also named William, studied medicine and became a doctor. The elder daughter, Maylan, married Len Williams, and their son, John Williams, is the internationally renowned guitarist. William's younger daughter, Toilan, spent many dedicated years of her life researching her father's uh, life and career. Work on publishing her biography of her father is currently underway. And by a curious quirk of faith, fate, I discovered a connection between my wife, Angie, and the Arquette family. Angie's grandfather, who was a general practitioner in Mansfield during the 50s and 60s, treated members of the Arquette family in northeast Victoria. In fact, uh, the uh, descendant that related this story to me said that as a child, uh, their dog had sustained an injury on its leg, and so they took it along to Angie's grandfather, Dr Vine, and he examined the leg, treated the leg, and bandaged it up. So the historical evidence indicates that Angie's grandfather was both a general practitioner and a vet. <laughs> Angie's father, who was an Anglican minister and spent a few years in Talangata in country Victoria, conducted the marriage of one of the Arquette descendants. So I think it was fate that has brought me along this journey as much as anything else. Let me now turn to William's education and training in the law. After some considerable time and effort, I think I've been able to work out the likely background to this. I say likely, as I'm yet to be completely uh, certain about the research that I've done. And I'd be very grateful, as the Dean mentioned, for any guidance that others might be able to provide. My understanding is that William completed an arts degree at Melbourne University from 1893 to 1897. In preparing for his legal career, William had two possible options from which to choose. One was to pursue the Bachelor of Laws, or LLB. The other option, which was cheaper and quicker, was to undertake the Article Clerk's course. And admission to that required uh, applicants to complete jurisprudence as a single subject. And that's what William did in 1897. In other words, he chose the Article Clerk's course over the more expensive and time-consuming Bachelor of Laws. Those who completed the Bachelor of Laws tended to be from uh, very affluent backgrounds. Although the Bachelor of Laws had a higher status than the Article Clerk's course, many prominent barristers and judges at the time were educated through the Article Clerk's course. I'm indebted to John, War, uh, John War's thesis for some of the details about this. In 1898, as the Dean mentioned, William joined Maddock and Jam Jamison, as Maddox was then known, and completed the Article Clerk's course in 1899. He then undertook his Articles of Clerkship from 1900 to 1903 and was ad admitted to practice in 1903. Curiously, and I'd be very grateful for any guidance on this, in fact, I'd even throw in a free meal and bottle of wine, William won the Supreme Court prize or judge's prize for article clerks in 1902. I'm curious about two things. First, why did he receive the prize in 1902, some three years after he completed the article clerks course? Was it because the prize was something that article clerks could apply or compete for after they had finished their course? Or was it based purely on the results from their course in the same way as the Supreme Court prize has traditionally been awarded to the top graduate in the LLB degree, now the JD degree. Secondly, I'm curious about the fact that although William was awarded the Supreme Court Judges Prize for Article Clerks, nobody appears to have been awarded the Supreme Court Prize for the LLB in 1902. Was this because the LLB students and the Article Clerks competed jointly for the prize? To finish this part of William's story, following completion of his Articles of Clerkship, William decided to join the independent bar, read with MacArthur, and signed the role in 1904. This is a page from the matriculation book at Melbourne University, indicating that William had passed the matriculation examination in 1993, sorry, 1893, and was therefore able to be admitted to the university to undertake an arts degree. It's interesting to note William's grasp of languages, namely Greek, Latin, English and French, on top of the Chinese language that he had spoken in the family and in which he had been educated in the Chinese classics 
by a private tutor engaged by his father. Indeed, as part of his advocacy in court, William was renowned for citing quotations from Shakespeare, Robbie Burns and Gilbert and Sullivan. You'll see the reference in this to Wangaratta and Wangaratta High School where William completed his secondary education. It's interesting to note that William was quite a renowned advocate and orator. Indeed, there is evidence to suggest that Sir Robert Menzies modelled his oratory skills after William. I'll return to Menzies a bit later. The matriculation book at the university also indicates that William had matriculated on 16 February 1897, which I think was for the purpose of taking jurisprudence on a single subject basis, although I might need to be corrected on that by those who know better. This uh, is a photo of the university records indicating that William had done jurisprudence as a single subject and had subsequently undertaken the Article Clerks course in 1898 and 1899. The records note that William studied Roman law, the law of property, the law of obligations, international law, equity, and the law of wrongs and the law of procedure. So let's talk a bit more about the Supreme Court prize or the Supreme Court Judges Prize in William's case. The Honours Board at the Law School lists those who had won this prize. There are some names before and after William's entry that should be familiar to many of us, including John Latham, who subsequently became the fifth Chief Justice of Australia, serving in that office from 1935 to 1952. John Clifford Valentine Behan, who was the second warden of Trinity College, serving from 1918 until 1946. And some years later, Robert Gordon Menzies, the 12th, uh, the 12th Prime Minister of Australia. The Honours Board also lists the presidents of the Law Student Society. William became president of this in 1907, after his career at the bar had commenced and joined a long line of prominent barristers and judges, including Henry Joseph, with whom William, William appeared in a couple of cases early on in his career. Charles Lowe, uh, who subsequently became a judge on the Supreme Court of Victoria. I note that Lowe served as Chancellor of the University of Melbourne from 1941 to 1954. Finally, it's interesting to note that Francis Plumley Derham served as president in 1908. Derham was a solicitor and the uncle of Sir David Plumley Derham, who succeeded Sir George Payton both as Professor of Jurisprudence in 1951 and also as Vice-Chancellor of the University in 1968. This extract from the inaugural issue of the Melbourne University magazine in June 1907 notes the election of William as President of the Law Student Society, with Derham as Vice President and a certain L.B. Cousin, later Sir Leo Cousin, as the Treasurer. Cousin subsequently became a Supreme Court judge and served as acting Chief Justice for a couple of years in the early 30s. Interestingly, he was also president of the Melbourne Cricket Club from the same year, namely 1907, until his death in 1933. Apparently, the Vienna Cafe was where all well-connected Melburnians met for a coffee back then. You may be wondering why I am engaged in so much name dropping. Apart from highlighting other historical legal figures at the time, it paints a picture of the professional community of which William was a member, and controversially perhaps, the extent to which other members of that community had gone on to hold high office as compared with William. I'll return to this theme later on. As I was reading the inaugural, inaugural issue of the magazine in 1907, I couldn't resist the temptation to share this amusing extract with you. Apart from the obvious gender bias, which was a reality in those days, it highlights the importance of sport, and in particular, the apparent divide between those who played cricket and those who played football. Interestingly, although I can't relate directly to this myself, being neither a cricket player nor a football player, I can relate to the comment about members of different schools being accustomed to ignoring one another's existence at the university. So such was the society, the milieu, in which William, who came from a family of uh, seven sisters, I remind you, 
lived and built his career. This is a photo of William, um, both at Jamison, uh, Maddock and Jamison, where he did his articles, and also uh, the photo of him when he was uh, admitted to the bar in 1904. And this is the photo, the one on the, the, the right here, that will soon be unveiled in the gallery, as the Dean mentioned earlier. There's an interesting extract in the book that was written about Maddox uh, by Helen Penrose, uh, in which she notes William's early involvement in the fight against discriminatory legislation. This legislation included the Victorian Shops and Factories Act of 1896, which provided that all furniture made by the Chinese had to be stamped accordingly. A Royal Commission in 1902 recommended that the Act be amended to require all, quote, Asiatics in the furniture industry to be licensed and to limit the number of licensed factories. The amending bill was passed in the Legislative Assembly, but didn't make it through the Legislative Council, apparently because it offended against notions of British fair play. More about this and William's role in the fight against discrimination later on. I'm indebted to Julian McMahon of Gorman Chambers for pointing out that William's roll number at the Victorian bar was 88, which is an extremely auspicious number from a Chinese cultural perspective. Both Julian and I thought that this was too remarkable to be a coincidence, and I set out to work out exactly how this might have come about. Although it's somewhat speculative, I worked out that there were three barristers who signed the role over three successive weekdays in 1904. Walter Sir George, uh, St George Spruill, who signed the role on Friday the 17th of June, William Arquette, who signed the role the following Monday, and George H Walker, who signed the role on Tuesday the 21st of June. Given that the other dates were separated by weeks or months, I think it's likely that there had been some coordination between the three barristers to enable William to obtain the number 88. Let me turn now to William's career, starting with his colleagues at the bar. I've done a pretty extensive analysis of cases, reported cases in which William appeared and have listed a selection of barristers with whom and opposite whom William appeared in these cases. The first list on this slide contains the names of barristers who subsequently became judges. As you'll see, it reads like a veritable honours board of famous judges from Victoria, including judges at the Supreme Court of Victoria and the High Court of Australia. Sir Arthur Dean is the former judge of the Supreme Court of Victoria who wrote A History of the Bar in 1968. More from Dean later on. I've also listed three barristers who didn't become judges but are nonetheless significant. The first is Sir William Harrison Moore, who subsequently became a professor of law and the third Dean of Law at Melbourne University. The chair that was named after him is currently held by Professor Hilary Charlesworth. William was one of three alumni who proposed the toast to Harrison Moore at a Law Student Society dinner in his honour in 1929. The others were Owen Dixon, who subsequently became Chief Justice of the High Court, and Kenneth Bailey, who subsequently became the first Australian-born Dean of the Law School. I mentioned J.A. Arthur as he was the first cousin of the grandfather of John Arthur, who is a current member of the Victorian Bar and a member of the National Executive Committee of the Asian Australian Lawyers Association. I also mentioned Edward Ellis as Joan Rosano QC, who was the first woman to become a, a, a QC in Victoria, read with Ellis and knew William personally. I'll return to Joan towards the end of my lecture. Sport figured prominently in William's life, as was and still is the case with many members of the profession and the judiciary. This photo from the Supreme Court of Victoria features William as scorekeeper for the Supreme Court cricket match circa 1904. Judging from the jackets, overcoat and brollies, it appears that the cricket team was an all-weather one. So let me turn now to uh, three of William's cases, and I've selected these for two reasons. The first two cases were selected to um, 
illustrate William's involvement in what we might refer to today as public interest cases. The third case was selected for its entertainment value and also to illustrate how William was depicted in the press. The first case, the High Court case of Potter and Minahan, is still cited as good law. It involved a man called Minahan, who was born of a Chinese father and a European mother in 1876, which was coincidentally the same year in which William was born. Minahan re resided in Victoria until the age of five, when he moved to China and lived with his father in his father's village until his father's death 20 years later in 1896. Minahan subsequently returned to Victoria in 1907, but failed the notorious dictation test and was charged by a customs officer with being a prohibited immigrant. According to the law report, and I quote, evidence was given by the customs officer administering the dictation test that he had told the defendant he was going to read out to him a passage of not less than 50 words in English and that he required him to write them out in English. That he said, here is paper and pencil for that purpose. If you write them, you'll be allowed to land. And if you fail to write them, you will not be allowed to land. I will read the passage slowly. And if you say you can write it, I will read it out slowly again. He then read a passage, read a passage and asked the defendant if he could write it. And the defendant, through an interpreter, said he could not. The question that fell to be determined was whether the Act was intended to apply to Australian-born subjects who would normally enjoy a right of entry. The question was decided in favour of Minahan. Uh, as Duffy, KC and Arquette argued, it's improbable that the legislature would have taken away this right except by express words or necessary implication. The second case arose in the context of the restrictions on Chinese workers under the Factories and Shops Act of 1905. As I mentioned before, following its enactment in 1896, the Act provided that all furniture made by the Chinese had to be stamped accordingly. William had railed against this discriminatory legislation in the paper that he wrote in 1906. So the case uh, Ingham and Hia Li was the interpretation or concerned the interpretation of section 42 of the Act, which prohibited persons at Chinese factories from working on any day during certain prohibited hours. In this case, the owner of a Chinese laundry had been charged with an offence for permitting a lodger to iron a shirt during the prohibited hours. To cut a long story short, Arquette in the Supreme Court of Victoria and subsequently with MacArthur and uh, in the High Court of Australia, successfully argued that the lodger had in fact been ironing his own shirt and that this was not an offence under the Act, as it did not constitute work that was ordinarily done in the factory within the terms of the legislation. The third case, which I selected for entertainment value, involved a fine that was imposed on an individual for making available a fruit machine also known as a slot machine, in the Stock Exchange Club in breach of the relevant gambling legislation. The question that fell to be determined by Judge Foster in the Court of General Sessions was whether the fruit machine was a game of skill or a game of chance, the latter being prohibited under the legislation. William had led evidence from consulting engineers to the effect that the fruit machine was a game of skill and that after practice it was possible to win every time. To demonstrate this, William arranged for a fruit machine to be brought into the court and told the judge that he would produce a cherry. After dropping his token into the machine, William managed deftly to manipulate the machine so that it produced a cherry. As the report in The Sun noted, and I quote, Judge Foster was interested. He asked Mr Arquette to repeat his skills, but the machine failed him. Judge Foster accordingly decided that the machine was a game of chance, after all. The headline is also amusing. Uh, Lung Tak Sam was a famous Chinese-born American magician of the time, who, among other things, had been a member of Houdini's Magicians Club. As the headline read, failed him, Arquette no Lung Tak Sam. 
Now that's how I think it would be pronounced in Cantonese. The Mandarin is Lung De Shan, which means dragon virtue mountain. And so I'm not being completely pretentious in adopting this pronunciation as distinct from the more obvious American one. The cartoon of Arquette has the caption, Mr. W. Kett on a leisure job, what price arithmetic? This no doubt reflects comments made by the judge who is reported to have said that the odds against winning were 1,000 to 10. The cartoon was drawn by Sam Wells, a prominent newspaper cartoonist of the day. It's interesting to reflect on the way in which court proceedings were reported on and depicted in the press during Williams' times. The press appears to have performed a more educative role than today in terms of reporting on how the legal system worked, including its protagonists, such as barristers and solicitors. Today, the focus appears to be limited to reporting on the facts of the cases, particularly facts that are controversial or salacious in nature. As time is running out, what I'd like to do now is invite you to read what various people have said about William Arquette. In particular, William was famous for being a great settler of cases, as noted in the extract from Dean's book, and also in comments by Sir John Minogue in 19, 1984, both of whom referred to Arquette's skills as a negotiator of settlements. This quote from Robert Menzies highlights the friendship that existed between both of them. Menzies had also practiced at the bar from Selborne Chambers, where William had maintained his rooms until the early 30s when he moved to Equity Chambers, subsequently known as Gorman Chambers. The quote is revealing for a number of reasons. First, Menzies believed that William would have been a very competent judge. Secondly, his keen sense of fun was concealed behind an almost immovable mask. Thirdly, there was a certain prejudice among clients against having a Chinese barrister, which limited William's practice to an extent. This begs the question as to the extent to which prejudice and discrimination may have limited William's career more generally. William clearly lived in a period of prejudice and racial discrimination. It appears, however, that William rose above that and dedicated much of his life to building bridges between the East and the West. In the biography of Joan Rosenove QC, Isabel Carter recounts the time when William said to Joan, you and I have both chosen the wrong profession, Joan. We will never satisfy our ambitions. Neither of us will ever be made a judge. You because you're a woman, I because I'm Chinese. We should have done medicine. Things have thankfully changed somewhat since then, although there's obviously still room for improvement. As noted by Chief Justice Kiefel at the award ceremony for the 2019 William Marquette Scholarship, his answer to the difficulties he faced appears to have been to succeed in what he did, to be a real part of the legal profession, to help others, and to act at all times righteously, with courage and with kindness. I think this comment is quite apt in capturing William's philosophy of life. Just a few more slides to share. In 1931, William took up chambers, as I mentioned, in the new equity chambers in the equity trustee trustees company building following Pat Gorman and a number of other barristers who moved there from Selborne Chambers. By another curious quirk of fate, Julian McMahon, who's here today, occupied the room previously occupied by William, which was the room on the right on the third floor overlooking Burke Street before Gorman Chambers moved to its current location in Lonsdale Street. The photo next to this is of William in his robes. Julian and I think that this was taken in the Supreme Court Library rather than in his room at Selborne Chambers, as I had previously assumed. Perhaps Joanne might be able to confirm that for us. And Joanne will be talking shortly about the forthcoming exhibition in the Supreme Court Library. William's old nominate law reports are now in the care of Chief Justice Alsop of the Federal Court of Australia. And I'm indebted to the former Chief Justice, Michael Black, for sharing with me the story of how he came into possession of the reports and arranged to have them rebound. The uh, reports bear William's uh, stamp, together with that of Elias Godfrey Coppel, a well-known silk at the time, whose son is Charles Coppel, who uh, is the renowned academic in Indonesian 
uh, politics and society. Finally, the report bears uh, the stamp or the signature of Michael Black. This is a photo of a two volume set of Taylor on Evidence, which William had in his collection and which has recently been restored by Sharon Prentice, the partner of William's late grandson, Paul Kett. These two volumes are significant as they pass through the hands of and bear the stamps of Benjamin Dunn, a judge of the Supreme Court of Victoria, and also Peter Gray, a former judge of the Federal Court of Australia. I'm grateful to Peter for sharing the story of how he gifted these two volumes to William's younger daughter, Toilan, when she was undertaking research for the biography of her father. So, together with a friend called William Leo, William Arquette founded the G.E. Morrison Lecture Series, named after the famous Australian journalist and sinologist George Ernest Morrison, or Morrison of Peking. And the lecture series continues to this day in uh, a day and you. In 1933, William delivered the second G.E. Morrison lecture in which he reflected on the similarities between Western culture and Chinese culture, particularly as embodied in the philosophy of Confucius. And there's an interesting reference in the press to William's supposition that if Confucius was alive at that day or on that uh, time, he would have been fascinated by the bagpipes. And that, I think, is a reference on William's part to the Scottish background of his wife, Gertrude. I thought it would be nice to close my lecture this evening with William's own words. Having carefully improved himself, a man may bend his mind to improving others and by the force of example, as well as precept, help to make the world a better and happier place. Thanks very much. Um, what I'd like to do now is invite Joanne Boyd to say a few words about the forthcoming exhibition in the Supreme Court Library. That was a really interesting talk about one of the people I think is one of the more interesting personalities that's um, been at the Victorian Bar. I'm the Archives and Records Manager at the Supreme Court of Victoria and I've been with the court for 15 years. And I've been working in the archives and it's pre presented me with the opportunity to work on records that are more than 170 years old. And I consider it both a privilege and a really interesting thing to be able to do. You can probably tell that because I've been doing it for 15 years. Um, working on this project with Andrew, I've been lucky enough to examine the original case uh, file for Ingham and Hai Lee, um, the, the infamous shirt ironing case, and, it's, um, and the prosecution under the Fa Factories Act. And that went all the way to the High Court, as you know, which in those days wouldn't have been that far because the Supreme Court building was also where the High Court used to sit as well. So um, Chief Justice Madden probably heard the original case well, the original case was heard at Carlton Police Station, the Carlton Courthouse, and then it came to us in the Supreme Court. I think probably if it was Chief Justice Madden, it may have been in the practice court, then it would have to the High Court, which would have been sitting in court too. So uh, William was very much in that building he, and, and that sort of thing, and that always fascinates me to think those figures moving around that building and using the robing rooms and everything like that. The case file also was in beautiful condition, by the way, the file. Not all my files are in that good a condition. But it said that he was, there was a cost was in there, which was fantastic. So it had all the detailed costs, and Mr Arquette was paid five pounds for appearing in that particular case. Um, there's, as well as that case, a copy of that case file, which we'll have on display, um, I'll also be looking a little bit about his relationship with the Supreme Court in the, in the library. So this will include a copy of the page from the admissions book with um, William Marquette's signature and the original of the cricket photo as well. So we've got that. And just as Andrew was showing you, the um, matriculation and books here in Melbourne, of course, the admissions book was much the same, so it'll have the name and the signature. I think Mr Arquette uh, was admitted with several other men on that. There was men at that time, although there were women being admitted by that point. Um, the court is just reopening to the public after a, a long COVID-induced hiatus and the exhibition isn't up and running yet. I'm still, my labels are at the manufacturers, as we say, but I'm hoping it'll be there by the 15th of March. Um, people are now welcome to come into our building. Don't think you can go into courtrooms yet, but we um, finally, finally, finally got our doors back open at the Supreme Court. So 
Thank you, Andrew. That was great. Like I said, one of the really interesting mm. characters with all of those people and one of the, of course, I'm a World War I historian as well, so I'm thinking, but you're not mentioning, it, it's Pompey Elliot as well, <laughs> things like that, and two of the other people that he served with on that Law Students mm. Society Committee, Frank Cass and Harold Harper, yeah. both died, mm. were um, killed during World War I. And their names are on a plaque in the library, I'd say. Yes, that's mm. right. Mm. Um, Harold Harper's brother was a famous historian, his name now has gave me. But yeah. yes, uh, any anyway. rate. Um, thank you, and let's start with a question and an answer. I'm sure you've got some questions. For Thanks, Jared. Okay, um, I'm Carol Hinchcliffe. I'm a law school librarian, and I've had a gr the great privilege of sort of being on the journey along the way with Andrew and all his explorations and delving into legal biography. Vanetta and Emily are here and they welcome any questions that you have. So do I have anybody with a question about Arquette or about the way Andrew got involved with legal biogra biography and, yes, Matthew Hardy. Right, Just wait one moment and the letter will come to you. Thanks, Andrew. That was um, extremely interesting. Um, I'm guessing you've um, uh, looked at William's correspondence, um, his letters and the like, and I'm just wondering whether you can say anything about the insights you've gained from, um, from looking at that, um, about the man or um, the relationships that he had uh, and so forth. Thanks for the question, Matthew. William didn't leave, unfortunately, many examples of his correspondence. Um, and I'd be really delighted to find copies of his correspondence, but he did leave a notebook um, that he completed in the final months of his life. And William uh, was affected by a stroke in the year in which he died, 1936. And uh, the stroke affected his, his right hand, so he couldn't write anymore. So what did William do being the um, inventive person that he was, he taught himself to write with his left hand. So the, the notebook that exists um, is a record of William's reflections and thoughts in the final months of his life. And that is really revealing. Uh, William shares his thoughts about uh, society, how to get on in life, what is the true meaning of life indeed, and what uh, we should all be focusing on. He was a man of great conviction. Um, he uh, was, amongst other things, a Freemason. So he subscribed to notions of universe, universal uh, truth and uh, equality. And that indeed was very much the way in which he, he conducted himself and led his life. Um, people often ask whether William made reference to or complained about the fact that he hadn't ever been appointed to the bench or he may have been overlooked in one way or another. But according to his younger daughter, Toilan, um, he never mentioned that uh, during his time with the family. He always focused on what it was that united us rather than what it was that might have separated us. And so he is quite an exemplar in terms of diversity. And when you think about the times in which he lived, as I outlined, and the people amongst whom he mixed, it's quite remarkable that uh, he did as well as he did um, given the times in which he lived. Uh, I think it's probably inconceivable, although others might like to argue with me and I'd be happy if they did, but I think it's inconceivable that somebody of Asian background would have been appointed to the bench in those days. So I think that's probably a given. As to whether he would have um, been granted silk, um, at the time, particularly in the 30s because of the depression, he, um, like a lot of other barristers, may have chosen not to take that step because he was worried about losing his income. But it's very inter interesting to reflect on how well he coped and how well he did and the uh, legacy that he's left for us today. Yes. Raina. Um, I think in around 
1912 or 1913, uh, William went to China as part of the Chinese Overseas Conference. And I'm just wondering whether you've come across anything that records either um, who else uh, attended that um, with him and or um, the discussions that were held and what um, views he had about uh, China at that time. I mean, obviously, it was the Republic of China, so it was before um, all the subsequent events. Um, but it would be quite interesting to know um, what his views were. Thanks, Rainer. Yes, he did travel to China in 1912. Um, he combined his trip to China to represent the overseas, Chi overseas Chinese at the um, convocation of the parliament after the Republic of China was established. He combined it with his honeymoon to Gertrude, which I thought was really efficient. <laughs> um, I could be uh, accused of doing the same things with my wife on occasion. But um, there are photos in the family archives of his trip to China, and they are quite interesting. He went there with um, a friend called Mihao Amoy, whose father was Louis Amoy, who's generally regarded as the father of the Chinese in Victoria. He was a successful businessman who emigrated to Australia, I think, in the 1930s or 40s, 1830s or 40s, and um, developed quite a bit of wealth through gold mining. Um, and so William was there to represent the overseas Chinese in Victoria. But what's interesting about the records is that uh, everyone was as interested in Gertrude's views of China and the fact that there was this uh, young Australian lady who had uh, travelled to China of all places and had come back uh, in one piece and having enjoyed it and with lots of stories to tell. And that was actually covered in the press. Um, unfortunately, uh, the Republic was short-lived in many ways before China descended into warlordism and internal uh, disruption. But uh, there is reference to William's trip to China in, um, believe it or not, the biography of G.E. Morrison, Morrison of Peking, um, in which uh, the biographer mentions this fact and also the extent to which um, uh, a lot of people from overseas had travelled to China to represent the overseas Chinese because from a, from a large, uh, from, from, from one perspective, the Chinese overseas were included in the development of the new republic. And um, as to what William thought about the experience, as to how easy, how easy he may have found it to mix with the Chinese in, in um, mainland China, one doesn't know. I suspect that he was educated in Mandarin, but his main dialect was Cantonese. And so um, it may have been somewhat challenging for him, uh, but I think he enjoyed the trip with his wife and she certainly enjoyed herself if the uh, press accounts are anything to go by. Sure. So we have a question. How was the legal profession seen in China during William's formative years? Was it seen as prestigious in China? Well, let's see. If you go back to the late 19th century when William first started, started studying law, uh, China really didn't have a formal legal profession as such. Um, it was only after the Republican movement that China started to modernise its legal system. It had toyed with modernisation in the early 20th century. Um, and it was then, if you like, that the modern civil law reform started to take off, but it never really gained a lot of traction. So it was really a very um, undeveloped legal profession. And uh, to a large extent, if you go back earlier, lawyers were identified more with scribes, people who would record what people agreed, maybe took down details for the purpose of their wills or uh, for the purpose of selling an asset or dividing family property. They, there wasn't such a strong profession in terms of advising on the law. Um, and other channels were used, if you like, to resolve disputes. So it was a completely different profession. Uh, and I'm not sure to what extent William was linked into that, but he was certainly very much part of the mainstream legal profession here, and a bit of a trailblazer, as we know. Okay, a question that follows on from that. 
Do we know if William was involved in part of the wider social environment of the bar, such as clubs and associations? Good question, to which I really don't know the answer. Um, William, as I mentioned before, was very interested in sport. Uh, but the main sport in which he got involved or was interested was uh, horse racing. And as I think it was Dean said, he was a keen, if not successful, punter. And, uh, and so there are photos in the family archives of William at the races, Flemington. Um, and there's some talk that perhaps William was uh, perhaps more unsuccessful than people thought. There's a lot of conjecture about um, what William uh, found during the 30s, the, the Great Depression, to what extent um, he'd been affected by the drop in income and the, uh, the reduction in the number of cases that went to court. Uh, but I tend to think that um, William uh, was in it more for the fun than for the money, as it were. Although, um, and I think that came out in that case about the fruit machine. So uh, he was a very keen uh, race horsing um, pundit. Uh, but as to um, how linked in he was, I think he was quite linked in, to be honest, because as I said, he was a member of the Freemasons. He uh, did mix in a broad range of uh, society. And um, so one assumes that he was pretty linked in with the legal profession, uh, many of whom regarded him as a real, real friend. Okay. We have time. Thanks very much, Andrew. A, a quick question. I think you recount how he counsels Joan Rosanov, um, mm. the difficulties that she will encounter as, as a practising lawyer. Were you able to obtain a sense through your research of the extent to which, if at all, William Marquette was mentoring um, other junior barristers uh, and providing counsel and advice particularly to the ethnic Chinese or indeed other um, ethnic groups around how to succeed at the bar? Uh, not really, Pip, and I think that's perhaps partly because there were very few, if any, others in his position. Uh, as to what mentoring he may have undertaken for junior members of the bar, I had the impression that he, he was actively involved in that um, because people spoke so highly of him and regarded him as a, as a friend and they referred to him as Willie, as you may have seen his, um, his name, uh, he was known as Willie Arquette. Uh, and so a lot of people had a lot of great things to say about him and a lot of the people who rose to great heights had been his junior, like Menzies, like Owen Dixon. And <clears throat> many of them had very good things to say about William and I think it, it may have reflected his mentoring. Cherie. Andrew, <laughs> um, this is not so much a question as a comment and perhaps a part of the continuing journey for, that is William Arquette. So first of all, I want to thank you for surfacing this story. It's taken 120 years. Um, and that actually is really significant. I can remember the time when my husband and I, I were both in the legal profession. And as Andrew mentioned, we, um, we were looking desperately for role models. And I remember saying, what does the internet say Who's the first? There must have been, were there any even Asian barristers or Asian lawyers before? We Googled and we found the name of William Marquette. And I remember being extremely excited after reading his story. And I think the significance of William Marquette's story that has now surfaced should not be lost on the generations of many Asian and particularly Chinese community lawyers who finally have a role model that's, and to see themselves represented in the legal profession ensures that they belong and that there is a path for them to belong. And I think that is the message of William Arquette's story. So I want to thank you for that. Well, thank you, Sheree. I, I think you've um, said it very eloquently. Uh, William Lai, of course, often says that you can't be what you can't see. And now that we can see William Marquette today, I think we can uh, learn from his example. And he is uh, very inspirational in that regard. 
And I must say that I'm just one of many people who have helped to promote his story and I've walked in the, in the, in the footsteps of those who've come before who have collected information, generated interest in the story and I thank both William and Raynard for that uh, in terms of my own journey. Thank okay. You, thank you, Andrew, for delivering such a highly engaging 20th Law Rare Book Lecture. It's a lecture that celebrated the achievements and so many contributions of William Arquette, a pretty remarkable University of Melbourne graduate. The delay in scheduling the lecture has, I think, had a silver lining. It gave you more time to continue your adventures in legal biography, more time to reflect, talk to more people, follow more leads. So, I guess we're thankful for the delay. I hope you've inspired others to think about pursuing legal biography and telling the many stories that are yet untold of so many um, Melbourne Law School graduates and members of the legal profession who um, are at the moment undiscovered. So thank you. MLS Dean Pip Nicholson for your introduction. A big thank you to Learning Environments and especially to the Law School events team. And thank you to everybody who came here to the Law School building tonight for this lecture and who've also joined us online. There will be a recording of this lecture that will be available in the coming weeks. So please, good night and uh, thank you again to Andrew.